Um, if some of this sounds familiar this morning, that's good. That means that you are starting to remember some of the things we've talked about before. And again, we learned by repetition, so that's a good thing. Um, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Lord, uh, thank you for this beautiful day, the beginning of springtime, that at least I personally have been yearning for since the first day of winter. So thank you for uh, bringing it around once again, as you always do. And thank you for Teddy and Joanne being back this morning. Um, you know how much we've been thinking about them and, and uh, praying for their getting well so they can join us. Uh, be with Pastor Bob this morning in his sermon and just help us to, as much as possible, to no devote this day to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, last week we had begun um, to talk about just what sin is. Um, it's commonplace today in many occasions or in many places to hear people say, I believe that people are basically good. I believe that the world is genuinely a good place. I believe that most people want to do the right thing, that most people want to be good. Um, but that generally minimizes what we actually experience and witness in the world today. Um, a lot of people say that, well, yeah, we do wrong, we sin, but that's the environment that is impacting us. It's the world we live in today. Well, my question is, if the world or people are basically good and basically well-meaning, why do you turn on the TV and look at the news or read a newspaper or just look around you and see so much corruption and evil in the world? The odds are, if all of us were born in uh, into innocence and into goodness, that some of that would have survived somewhere. Um, if all of us were genuinely good and innocent when we came out of Mama Shoot, that we should be able to find little um, areas of good people, areas where the government is good, areas where the population or the society is good. But we don't see that. Whether you are in the Amazon River Basin in South America, whether you are in Detroit, Michigan, or Baghdad, there are people that have some elements of good in them, but universally we find corruption. I don't think you can name a government on this planet that does not have corruption involved in what they do. I don't think you can go to a city or state in this country or any other country and find that they are not dealing with corruption and evil. Since the fruit is universally corrupt, we look for the root of the problem in the tree. Jesus indicated that a good tree does not produce bad fruit. So if we are basically from a good gene pool, if you will, or a good tree, then you would see a predominance of good fruit. Because a good tree cannot produce bad fruit. A bad tree cannot produce good fruit. So what I'm getting at is that the tree is corrupt. Where we came from was corrupted by the fall of Adam and Eve. Many people think that Adam and Eve are just a story, but let me put it to you this way. Even atheists, even um, evolutionists agree that we all come from a single source. We have all come from, well, of course, the evolutionists um, agree or believe that we all came from a bonding of a cell or cells 
that eventually mutated into what we are today. But they agreed, nonetheless, that it was a single source from which we sprang. Well, if that is true, then why would it not be true? And it seems certainly more uh, relevant to me that I came from a pair of human beings than I came from a pair of monkey genes. I'm just saying, believe what you want, but it makes more sense to me to believe that my parents looked more like me, uh, meaning my initial ancestors. So when Adam and Eve fell, it corrupted human nature. And as the old church speak says, we don't, we're not sinners because we sin, we sin because we're born sinners. It's as simple as that. Or, now what we want to talk about this morning is original sin. You've heard that, um, have you not? Have you heard that bounced around? People talk about the original sin or what is original sin. And oddly enough, um, there are people, at least in Hollywood in the past days gone by, or people that were writers or artists or whatever, that talk about the original sin having something to do with sex. Nothing could be further from the truth. God created sex within marriage, and that's a great thing. Um, original sin also does not refer to the fall of Adam and Eve. It doesn't mean when Eve went over, took the fruit, bit it, and gave it to Adam, that was not the original sin that they're talking about. Original sin that we have to... We can rationally deduct original sin simply because of all the corruption we see today. But in biblical terms, original sin does not primarily refer to Adam and Eve's sin. It refers to the result of that first sin. And the origin of the result was the corruption of the human race that followed after Adam and Eve. That is original sin. It refers to the fallen condition in which we are born. Now, if you question whether there was, in fact, a fall, all you need to do is refer to Scripture, and it is very clear on that point. Um, the way the Westminster Catechism, and you may have noticed I keep referring to that, that is not necessarily something that has been adopted in Baptist circles, but um, it is the clearest profession of faith, I believe, that has been written by uh, the early church fathers. But the way uh, original sin is described in the Westminster Catechism, it says, our parents being seduced by the subtlety and temptation of Satan, sin in eating the forbidden fruit. This, their sin, God was pleased, according to his wise and holy counsel, to permit, having purposed, to order it to his own glory. Now, what does that mean? Um, and this is a long conversation that we have to save for another day, but uh, basically this, comes, this statement comes from the early church arguing about whether or not God could have created a world without sin. Could he not have stopped Adam and Eve from committing the sin that has infected all mankind since? The answer is yes, he could have. However, then the question becomes one of could God have created such a world and still given human beings free will? No. No. Because if human beings were created to only do good, that means they had to be coerced in some way to do only good. They had no choice, in other words. No choice is not freedom. To be free is to be able to choose. So what it means here is God allowed this to happen so that he could use it for good in his plan. Now what does that mean? 
he used the evil that came about through the fall, through that sin, through the original sin that infected us all, to fulfill his plan of redemption through Jesus Christ. Make sense? He used that evil, knowing that it was going to happen, knowing that he, if, if children are given a choice, they're going to choose wrong on many occasions. All of us have. All of us will continue to do so until we're called home. Um, not that we want to. It's just going to happen. But God uses that to fulfill his plan of redemption. Um, so the fall did, in fact, occur. The results, however, reached far beyond Adam and Eve. They not only touched all my, mankind but corrupted all mankind. We are sinners in Adam. We cannot ask, when does the individual become a sinner? Because sinners are sinners before they're even born, as they are created and uh, developed in mama's womb. The Westminster Confession, again, expresses why um, the fall relates to human beings. It says, by this sin they fell from the original righteousness and communion with God and, see, and so became dead in sin and wholly defiled in all the parts and faculties of soul and body. They being the root of all mankind, Adam and Eve. The guilt of this sin was imputed and the same death in sin and corrupted nature conveyed to all their posterity descending from them by ordinary generation. Um, ordinary ge generation would mean in the gene pool, so to speak. The human gene pool was corrupted. And by the way, we've talked about this before. Um, people have often asked, well, um, how did the earth get populated if Adam and Eve were the only two people on the planet? Well, obviously, Excuse me. Being the only two people on the planet, the earth was populated by their progeny, their descendants, marrying each other. They were the only people on the earth. Brothers married brothers, cousins married cousins, sisters married brothers, etc., etc. And we're horrified at such a thing happening. We feel like we've all been transplanted to Alabama. But that is not the case. The reality is that the gene pool at that time from the very beginning, the gene pool was pure. There was no corruption between brothers and sisters and cousins and nephews and so on and so forth. The injunction against marrying siblings or relatives came in the Mosaic Law thousands of years later. Because by that time, by the time of Moses, the gene pool was so corrupt that they needed to make a law to stop this business because you're creating problems in humankind. And you can see this um, if you go back and um, read any kind of book on the Egyptian pharaohs, the Egyptian kings, you'll notice that toward the end of the Egyptian dynasties, now, once again, if you're a god, then the only proper person for you to marry is another god or goddess. So pharaohs oftentimes ended up marrying sisters or brothers back and forth, which was perfectly fine back, back here. But by the time it got to this position, toward the end, long story short, you'll see pharaohs' heads are shaped like this. And their abdomens are not fat, but they're distended. This was a result of the, the incest, the intermarrying that late in mankind that caused these birth defects. In any event, um, but that's how the earth was populated early on. Uh, David puts it this way in the 51st, 51st Psalm, verse 5. Um, we are sinners not because we sin, but rather we sin because we are sinners. Thus David says, surely I was sinful at birth, 
sinful from the time my mother conceived me. So, this was known all the way back in the time of David. Now, this is all very depressing, talking about how sinful we are and we can't escape it and all the rest of it. We're going to go on and um, talk a little more about that. What, if, what does it mean to say that human beings are depraved? Well, the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and nobody comes and all fall short of the glory of God. None seek God of their own. None. Nobody. Uh, and if you think, well, that, that's a little harsh. Uh, maybe, you know, there may be some people over there, not according to the Bible, not according to God. By God's standards, none seek him. Um, the idea to persist once again, despite these shortcomings, despite what the Bible tells us, and God's witness that this is true, and God cannot lie, despite all of that, we still find that there are people, as we said, that believe that people are genuinely or basically good. Uh, we, we, our moral record may have some blemishes, but nonetheless, we are basically good. And that sin somehow kind of lives out on the periphery of our lives. That it's not something that is internal, but it's kind of out here. Um, there was a man that after being rescued from captivity in Iraq, and experiencing firsthand the corruptions of the Iraqi government under Saddam Hussein and also uh, his ways of dealing with political dissidents. That man, when re rescued, actually said, and I quote, despite all that I endure, I never lost my confidence in the basic goodness of people. Um, perhaps this man would have said that based on uh, what we may have as a sliding scale to judge sinfulness. For example, um, next to Saddam Hussein and Idi Amin um, and Adolf Hitler, I'm a saint. I mean, I am golden. Um, I am the best person that ever walked the planet. I'm 10 feet tall. But that is in comparison to them. That is not who we compare ourselves against. Comparing ourselves, comparing our sinfulness against other sinful people is basically just an, an exercise in futility because it's like it's like measuring various shades of black they're all black one may be a lighter black one may be a darker black but they all be black and the bible teaches the total depravity of the human race now what does that mean there's a difference between total depravity and utter depravity. Now, I'm not trying to get into semantics here. I'm not trying to split hairs. It's important that we understand, at least understand this. Um, because, again, if we are witnessing to unbelievers, which is the one thing we are called on to do, we're going to get questions like this. We may not have a... Um, doctorate background on the answers to these questions, but we can have a good idea how to approach them. Um, total depravity. <laughs> we are told that down to our very core, we are sinful. That is body and soul. Um, to be Totally depraved means just that. Even a Joseph Stalin was extremely depraved, but he could have been more depraved.
grave than he was. It's hard to imagine, but he could. Um, maybe Stalin only took out his um, hostility, his bestiality, if you will, on political dissidents, and he loved his sons and daughters and grandchildren. He could have taken his focus out, his viciousness out on his political prisoners and his children and grandchildren. That would be to be utterly depraved. There's a difference. We are sinful to our very core. We are totally depraved, totally sinful, but we are not utterly given over to where we do nothing but sin 24-7. Does that make any sense? I know it seems like it's splitting hairs, but the two are different. The two are different, and you need to recognize, I'm not saying you need to memorize all this because there's going to be a test at the end, and if you fail the test, you can't come to church. I'm not saying that, but you should be familiar with these ideas. Um, I could sin more than I do. Uh, in my mind, because as I've gotten older, I am much more convicted about even words that I say than I was when I was a man in my 20s. I wasn't convicted about nothing in my 20s. Now, granted, I never murdered anybody. I guess I would have been convicted by that. But the things I did do, I didn't think much about, it, to be honest with you. Now I'm even convicted of what I say or what I think. So I have grown some, I would say, over the years. But it is not a relative thing. Whether you want to think about it now or not, it doesn't change what it is. And again, um, perhaps what I should say is rather than total, um, I would say radical, radically depraved. Now radical doesn't mean what it does today. Uh, we've got all these extreme, extreme sports and it has become common like um, cross, uh, motocross and the ski jumps and all the really crazy stuff that people do now. We call that radical. But that's not what they're talking about. The Latin word radical, um, the root of it meant core. So what we're saying is we are, we are depraved or we are sinful to our core. And the reason that we talk about not every Sunday. The, re the reason we need to be reminded of that is because that, that is us, that is in us. And if we're not conscious of it, if we're not careful, um, then we can, it's easy to give ourselves over to that. It's easy. Look at the people that you have known, perhaps in your past, that are totally given over to drugs or alcohol or something like that that you never would have believed when they were younger that that's how they would turn out. It's easy, once you start uh, taking the bait, so to speak, to give yourselves over to it, and then once you're far enough down the road, there's no turning back, or it's very difficult to turn back. So we need to be conscious of what we are capable of. You may find this hard to believe, and especially the stage you're at now in your life, but we are all capable of being Joseph Stalin's. We all have it in us. But for the grace of God, we would be a Joseph Stalin, or an Idi Amin, um, or anyone that you choose to look at as an evil person. And we are reminded once again um, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. That's the Bible talk. So don't get mad at me. Um, <laughs> the next thing that we're going to 
talk about is what does or what role does the human conscience play in the way we deal with our natures? Um, any of you that saw it, um, the original Disney Pinocchio, remember that? You all see that back in the day? Um, there was a character in the Pinocchio movie named Jiminy Cricket. And some people today will say, holy Jiminy Cricket. But Jiminy Cricket was um, Pinocchio's mentor, so to speak. And Jiminy Cricket said, always let your conscience be your God. Another way to put it today is follow your heart. Follow your heart. What does the Bible say about your heart, by the way? It is desperately wicked beyond all things. And we're told, follow your heart. Okay. Um, the conscience is a great thing to listen to if it has been taught by the Word of God. If you take Jiminy Cricket's advice and it has not been taught by God's Word, to follow your conscience can be disastrous. Because if you have no conscience or you have a conscience that has been reared in evil, then your conscience is going to tell you to do evil. It's as simple as that. It's kind of like your vocation. If you have studied to be a carpenter under a very good and conscientious carpenter, you're probably going to turn out to be a good carpenter. But if you have studied carpentry under someone who only looks for ways to cut corners, only looks for ways to squeeze more money out of your customers, in all likelihood, that's the way you're going to turn out. So, following your conscience is only a good thing if your conscience is properly trained. Um, conscience is often described as like an inner voice that we have um, that God has planted in us um, that helps us to either make good decisions or poor decisions. It basically includes two elements. An inner awareness or consciousness of right and wrong and also number two um, a mental ability to apply laws and society's norms. In other words to know right from wrong. Now today If we had no background in the Bible, if we had no background in Christ, and we only had society to tell us what was right and wrong, what kind of shape would we be in? Terrible. I mean, and I'm not, I'm just saying. I don't think anyone can find anywhere in the Bible any lesson from Jesus any word from God or the prophets that would say, Thou shalt abort. It's against God's law. It's murder. Uh, I'm just saying. Look in the Bible. You'll find no excuse for the abortion that we have in the world today. But that aside, if you were to grow up in an unbiblical society, you would grow up believing that that was okay. It's the law of the land. Why would they make a law that is evil? So you would go along with society and live your life like that was perfectly okay. The only way we can know right from wrong is here. It's the only way. And that conscience is put in us to help us to know what is right and what is wrong and to give us the ability to choose. 
Now, people have a moral responsibility to follow their conscience if it is trained by the Bible. On the other hand, if our conscience persuades us that something is unlawful or sinful, for lack of a better term, but it's not, if the Bible doesn't say it is, but you in your head and in your heart believe it is, then you're sinning by going against your conscience. Now that doesn't mean you have the right to convince other people that it's a sin when it's not stated as such in the Bible. But you don't want to go against your conscience if you believe something is really wrong, whether it is or not. It is to you. It is to you. Something has told you that this is wrong, and if I do it, I'm going to feel rotten, or I'm going to get hurt, or someone else is going to get hurt. So if you think it's wrong, don't do it. Last but not least, or next to last but not least, what do you believe is the unforgivable sin? No right or wrong answer. Just blurt it out. Murder. I'm sorry? Murder. Murder? To call what the Holy Spirit has done sin. To call what the Holy Spirit has done sinless. Sinful? I would consider Christ and God if not as our Savior, our divine being. That would be. To, to deny him? Yes. Okay. Um, there are a lot of, and we talked about, talked about this last week, um, the Catholic Church has two types of sins, venial sin and mortal sin. Venial sin is just kind of your regular everyday sin. Go to the priest and confess it and you're, you're all good. Mortal sin, again, uh, Catholics believe that we have a gas tank behind us. I, know, I guess it would look, make you look kind of like a beetle or something. But we have a gas tank behind us that is full of grace. Full of God's grace. And every time we commit a mortal sin, that gas tank runs out of gas. It's like the, the the container springs a leak, springs a leak, and you've got to go in and get that tank refilled because once you're out of God's grace, you're out of God's grace. You're you're not protected anymore. You're a bad person, and all that. So you got to do stuff, penance they call it. Um, you've got to do nine Hail Marys. You got to uh, go somewhere and visit a shrine or whatever, and then your tank of grace will be filled back up, and all it's all good. Okay, well. The Bible says all sins are mortal sins. And we talked about how if you only committed one little sin in your whole life, you're still not in a good space because if you don't have Christ, it's all over. Be that as it may, the unforgivable sin, if we are Christians and we are introspective, um, that idea of an unforgivable sin should strike terror into your heart because have I committed the unforgivable sin and if you have it's too late it is unforgivable it's not like you can I did that and come back later and say geez sorry no if it's unforgivable it's unforgivable now some people will say there's no such thing as a sin that God can't forgive no such thing. And I agree that you could be um, who's that clown that, that killed people and ate them? I don't remember his name. Dahmer. Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer. You could be Jeffrey Dahmer and it, it, this would be between him and God, obviously. But you could have a real come to Jesus on the day you were electrocuted and still be saved. I know that rankles us because we said, we never did anything like that. But that's, that's the truth. Dahmer, the day he was getting ready, or the day while well, he was eating his last meal before he went into the, the, uh, the chamber, 
to be put away. If he had a sincere come to Jesus, we'd see him in heaven. As hard as that is to believe. Various attempts have been made to identify the specific crime that is unbelief, unforgivable. It's been assigned to such things as murder, adultery, um, pedophilia would rank right up there as far as I'm concerned. Um, however, though both of these sins are clearly horrible, or all these sins are clearly horrible, they are not unforgivable. Scripture has made it clear that they may be forgiven if earnest repentance is made. Look at David. David is still called a man after God's own heart. And he wasn't just adulterous with Bathsheba, but he eventually found a way to have her husband murdered. And you know what's never talked about? That Bathsheba goes along with all this. I don't, I don't know why that is, but David has committed as grievous a sin as you can, to him, as, as you can even imagine. But yet he's a man after God's own heart. Why? Well, we'll get down a rabbit trail if I follow this too far. But because once it was made known to him by Nathan, by the prophet Nathan, that the man was him. Because David, like the rest of us, put it out of his mind. He just wanted to forget about it. But when Nathan reminded him, David repented with his whole heart. And God accepts that. Now, having said that, there were consequences to be sure for what David did. God forgave him, but God didn't take away all the misery that he was going to attend to him the rest of his life through Absalom and, and other um, ways. But again, that's a rabbit trail. Um, frequently, the unforgivable sin is identified with persistent and final unbelief in Christ. Since death brings the end of a person's opportunity to repent and sin and embrace Christ, um, that seems to make sense. Because if you have refused Christ all along, you're going to die without having Christ. And yeah, that's the unforgivable sin. But that's going to happen to everyone. Who, who dies or passes away without Christ. Everyone is going to suffer the same thing. Though persistent and final unbelief does not bring about um, such con consequences, it does not adequately, adequately explain Jesus' warning concerning blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy is something one does with the mouth or the pen. It means making a confession. It involves words. When Jesus warned of the unforgivable sin, it was in the context of his accusers declaring that Jesus performed his miracles in league with Satan. His warning was sober and frightening, as it should be. Yet even on the cross, Jesus prayed for the, forgive, for the forgiveness of those who blasphemed against him on the grounds of their being ignorant. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now we come to the punchline. If, however, People are enlightened with the truth of the gospel to the degree that the Holy Spirit has made them aware that they know Jesus is truly the Christ. They know that they know that they know. And then they accuse him of being satanic. That is the unforgivable sin. If you know, if the Holy Spirit has enlightened you that, I mean, I, sometimes I just get goosebumps. I don't know about y'all. 
But every now and then I've got an epiphany. It's not much because I'm a sinful man and he doesn't come to me that often in, in an epiphany. But sometimes he does and I just get goosebumps. And this right now is one of those moments. This is the sin for which there is no pardon. If you have known and you have professed Christ and maybe um, in your 30s or in your 20s you went on mission trips and you shared Christ with others and you were down on your knees 10 times a day thanking God for all that he's done and sending his son Jesus Christ and you really and truly believe that, which only you would know, but then you turn from that and accuse Jesus of being manipulated by Satan, you're finished. You're not going to come back from that. That, my friends, is the unpardonable sin. We are confident that God is, uh, is in his preserving grace will restrain his elect from ever committing such a sin. I'm confident, and I've had some spurry thoughts in my mind, uh, when I'm praying and so forth. Uh, I don't know where they come from, but uh, I can't believe I'm in front of God's throne, praying to him, and this stuff is going into my head. I don't know where it comes from or why. But I'm confident that Christians left to their own devices are capable of committing the unpardonable sin. In other words, left to ourselves, you and I can do this, but I'm confident that because we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will not let us. And thank God for that. Thank God for that. Those who do commit such a sin would be those people who are so hardened of heart and abandoned in their sin as to feel no remorse for what they're doing. They would be those that we were calling totally to pray. Um, now, last thing, I just want to make you aware of what a word means, um, it should it ever come up, because it's something that we need, and I know I've got about three minutes. Um, I know it's something that we need to be aware of today because it's still happening today, and the word is syncretism synchronism syncretism you don't have to be able to say it you just have to know what it means okay? it's spelled yeah s y n c r e t i s m syncretism it's not a word you're going to find in the bible but what it means is um, when the hebrews went into the promised land what did god tell them to do wipe everybody out wipe them out and, of course, unbelievers make a big deal out of that, and I don't have time to talk about that today. But he said, get rid of them, because I'm sending you into this land to be a light to the world. And you cannot be a light to the world if you are infected by other beliefs and other cultures. That's what syncretism is. So what's a good definition? Um, syncretism is um, the process by which aspects of one religion are assimilated into or blended with another religion, thereby leaving both of them less than what they were. And that's essentially what they're trying to do today. Exactly. Yeah. That's why I say the only reason I bring this up is it's important today. That ecumenical movement, isn't that what it's based on? Absolutely. Like? Give away all the all your theology, just whatever can make you get together you and afraid. sing kumbaya. Yeah. Yeah. Forget whether this one is right or wrong, or this one is right or wrong. We need to all unify right. so we can sing kumbaya to the world. <laughs> um, no, you don't give up the truth to make it more palatable to people that don't want to chew it can't do that. But anyway, syncretism, once again, is that process whereby you, many times without even knowing it, incorporate different aspects 
of the world, doesn't even have to be a religion, but the world or another religion into yours, thereby corrupting what you have. And that is exactly why God, of course, he knew they wouldn't listen. He knew they wouldn't be, be, believe or behave or do what he said, but that's exactly why he said to get them out. Because what happened is they ended up incorporating the Canaanite gods of, of Baal and Asherah. They ended up incorporating the Assyrian god uh, Asher and the Babylonian god Marduk. All this came in to the light of the world, thereby diminishing the light and actually putting it out. I think. That's a lot. Congratulations for staying awake for the whole 45 minutes. You done good. <laughs>